it's very important to establish that the patient has genuine treatment resistance or treatment refractoriness uh, because there are many spurious conditions that may give the impression that the patient is not responding to the antipsychotics but there are actually some some hidden causes for that one the patient was not given an adequate trial an adequate trial includes the maximum tolerated dose uh, for a duration of at least 16 weeks uh, to, to, to say, to, to, to label it as an adequate trial. So if you don't give it an adequate dose and it's not a, an adequate duration, that can be a spurious treatment resistance in some patients. Then you have uh, patients uh, who, uh, who smoke a lot and, and, and may actually metabolize uh, some of the antipsychotics like olanzapine, like haloperidol. Uh, because it induces cytochrome uh, A12. Uh, on the other hand, there are also other antipsychotics that may be uh, uh, hypermetabolized due to the, to the presence of, uh, of another uh, inducer, uh, drugs like carbamazepine, for instance, uh, that increase the, uh, the uh, catabolism of the drug. Uh, there could be substance abuse. Uh, patients uh, may not be responding to the antipsychotics because they're taking the street drugs, hallucinogens, psychotogens, whether it's cocaine or amphetamine or mushrooms or, or PCP or ketamine, there's a lot of drugs that can worsen psychosis even when the patient is taking an antipsychotic and this might be a spurious cause of, for so-called treatment resistance or refractoriness. That's why we should always do drug screens for our patients. Then there are uh, patients who are labeled as treatment resistant because they're not improving with a certain antipsychotic but some of those antipsychotics require food in the stomach uh, to, to have maximum absorption. Uh, example for that would be ziprasidone. Uh, example would be loracidone. Uh, the presence of food uh, in, the, in the stomach will increase the absorption by two to three fold. So if the patient takes their medication on an empty stomach, they're absorbing only half or less than half of the drug. So, so the, the, the judgment that the patient is not responding maybe because the dose that you think you're giving to the patient is not actually reaching their brain at the full dose. It's, 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 uh, it's half absorbed. And so that's another spurious cause for uh, treatment resistance. Uh, the, the opposite is also true, by the way. Some medications need to have an empty stomach, not without any food, the better, better absorption. One example for that would be cotiapine XR. It is absorbed better on an empty stomach. And then there's, there's a drug, uh, one drug that comes to mind where, where you got to give it in the morning because it, it, uh, it's, it's an extended release product of peliperidone, uh, peliperidone ER. Uh, you got to give it in the morning because it, it releases the drug with peristalsis during wake up, waking hours. So it needs about 15 to 20 hours to actually uh, release the drug gradually as it goes, traverses the GI tract. And if you give it at night, some, if some patients take it at night, you don't get the full absorption because peristalsis is less so at night. These are some examples of, uh, of conditions. There are also medical, comorbid medical conditions that are undiagnosed, which can actually be perpetuating the psychotic symptoms. And those conditions will not respond to, to, to an antipsychotic. May not even respond to clozapine either. But we're talking about def defining a patient as treatment resistant or refractory to one of the first line antipsychotics, either the first generation or the second generation antipsychotics. Which reminds me, by the way, that, that when clozapine was approved for treatment refract refractory schizophrenia in the late 80s, it was based on, on failure to respond to the first generation, because the second generation had not yet come to the market. So it was haloperidol and, flu and clopromazine and flufenazine and perfenazine and all of those older first generation. That, those, those were the patients who were put in the clinical trials for clozapine and clozapine actually was significantly better than any of them in the, in the treatment refractory patient to the first generation. Later in the 90s when some second generation drugs came uh, to, the, to the marketplace and were, were you getting used we found that some patients who were refractory to one of the first generation drugs actually responded reasonably well, decent, decent response to one of the second generation drugs. So 
what we have now is like two types of treatment resistance or refractoriness. There's a subgroup that were resistant or refractory to the first generation and the group that were resistant or refractory to the second generation. And uh, they don't, they're not exactly the same. There's some overlap, but they're not exactly the same. And so it, is, it, might, be worth, it might be worth giving the patient who, is, who has been deemed refractory to haloperidol, for instance, to give them one of the second generation drugs, an adipotrol or two, uh, to see if they respond to it before you commit them to clozapine therapy.